Hello, welcome to another episode of the Sung's Garage podcast with Sung Kang and me, Alex Harrington. Today we're talking to two racing drivers, Abby Eaton, who you might know from the Grand Tour, where she was their trained racing driver, and George Collado, who you might know from the Carfection YouTube channel. We talk about how to become a better driver, how to deal with negativity and failure, and their new show on the Carfection YouTube channel called Track Mode, where they take us around some of the greatest tracks on the planet, give us the history, and show us how to get the best time behind the wheel. This is a great episode. We really enjoyed having them on. Enjoy. Is that a dog? It is. <gasps> DJ. Oh, my goodness. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's my, one, of, one of our co-hosts. It's, one of our it's co-hosts. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Lovely <laughs> cloud. Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. I didn't even know this. Genuinely didn't even know <laughs> Until I moved. No, me neither. I was like, that's a lovely rug. <laughs> a lovely cushion. <laughs> Yeah. Are you guys dog folks? Anybody have dogs out there? Uh, I I do Hi. not. Um, uh, but uh, I know Abby does. Well, you kind of do, don't you, Abby? Um, yeah, I love dogs. I'm obsessed with them. It's the first yeah. thing. If we're going to like someone's house, I'm like, it, do they have a dog? And I'm actually picking my puppy up on Friday. Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah. What kind of Little, puppy? Um, it's a French bulldog, so it's mine and Mimi the half's first Aww. dog together. And she um, has always wanted a French bulldog. So, yeah, finally gave in and um, <laughs> going to pick her up on Friday. So, she's tiny. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's nice. It's a perfect time to have a puppy. They said yeah. that at the, all the shelters in the States um, were emptied out during the COVID because mm. people wanted puppies at home. So, yeah. 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 We've had the same thing over here. I've had I've had lid on it. We can we get a puppy? Can we get a puppy? It's like no, <laughs> not yet. We just got a cat. The cat will eat it. Gosh. Yeah. Wait. For, before we go anywhere, Abby, is this is this legal? Is that? Yeah, that looks all right. I think that would pass. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually. <laughs> Strong enough. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that a, a proper cup of tea? A, cup, a proper, proper brew. Tea. Yeah, yeah. Yes. What is so? What is what is the recipe for the perfect cup of tea? Because I, I I lived in London for about six months, and I never drank tea mm-hmm. until I moved to London. And I love tea, <laughs> but once I came to the states, it's really hard to drink tea here because it's, yeah. it's not it's you know, it's not common coffee. We're we're a coffee city or coffee country, so mm-hmm. I started reverting back to coffee, and I started noticing that my tempo was off. Yeah. You know, because I think tea, I understood the whole phrase, be calm, mm. right? Stay, stay calm. Well, you guys say <laughs> stay calm, yeah. right? Yeah. Just have a cup of tea. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. if you just want to chill, you have a brew. But you've yeah. got to start with Yorkshire tea bags. Okay, that's I'm going to hand over to Abby to, to run you yeah. through because okay. I, I am no tea authority. Bags. Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's the main thing. But, but also hard water to brew the cup of tea with is important as well, which is, um, I don't know where you live as to what kind of what you have but i mean you can't change what you've got so just put whatever what you've got put in it <laughs> nice and hot um, and semi-skimmed milk and not too much semi-skimmed. of it and there you go mm. yeah you don't have to brew it forever some people are running about brewing it for ages just give it a good stir for like a minute out done yeah. how many yeah. cups of tea do you go through a day abby oh. If it's an admin day, probably 10. Wow. And yeah. Wow. How about you, Jorge? That's, that's so I, be, being from Portugal, I, again, same thing as you, like coffee was like my, my thing. Um, and I actually had a problem that when I moved to the UK, obviously I, I was in a house share and, you know, there was about four of us. And I was living with, I, I never lived with anyone else from Portugal or anything else. I kind of moved straight into the heart of the UK in London, living with Brits. And every once in a while, like, you know, we'd have a a flat meeting about someone, someone not tidying up this or not doing that. Or, you know, there was kind of these family meetings, but just between housemates. And the first one that was called on me about me was that I didn't offer to make tea enough. (laughs) And it was just like, for me, it just, it, it was totally not a conscious thing. It wasn't an evil thing. It just wasn't in my DNA, you know what I mean? To like, Because every time they'd go like, oh, I'm making a cup of tea, do you fancy one? I was like, oh, actually, yeah, absolutely. But it, it just never like, this, 
it just would never pop into my head to offer other people like, do you want a cup of tea? Because I never would. It just wasn't, you know, a thing. So I now, I, I sort of got back into coffee eventually after coming here. And same as you, I, I had to kind of cut back on the coffee a bit because I was just hitting the limiter a bit, uh, a bit too yeah. easily. So fine yeah. tea is like that sort of, it just takes the edge off a little bit, uh, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, I, I would, I, I drink maybe one, maybe two a day. So, mm. about you, Alex? Started started as well, can I'm I just, yeah. can, can I just introduce someone, mate? Right, come here. So this is my yeah. half, Jess, right? Oh. And she, Hi, um, Hi, Jess. <laughs> was one of the drivers for the Fast and Furious live um, show, mm -hmm. um, and she ended up uh, buying one of the three fifties um, that was used in the film. So she has that in the garage and yeah she loves you she thinks you're awesome so <laughs> which three which which uh, movie did they use your 350 in? i'm sorry which 350 <laughs> which hey? three nice to meet you nice to meet Hi. you and you uh, which 350 from which uh, film the one from uh well i'm sure there were several but the 350z from tokyo drift Oh, oh, the, the black key gray black one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, the, with, the, with the dragon or the yeah. with the whole thing on there. Oh, you yeah. have that car? Well, I'm sure. That, I think there's like two or three like that. that are still usable. Yeah, I got one of them. The one that we used in this show. It's modified a bit now. It's got an LS3 in it, but yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> where was where was this live show? Was it the Universal? Is that is that one you're uh, talking about? I think yeah, it was backed by Universal. Vin actually came to one of the shows and he kicked off the premiere in uh, the O2 Arena and then we traveled Europe and it was supposed to go abroad, but um, supposed to go to the world, but unfortunately never got that far, but it was, um, it was a, the best time of my life and it was really awesome. Wow. wow. So well, the rest of the drivers on the show are going to be so jealous that I've had this conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you. I always love to meet Bass family because everyone who's worked on the movie or the franchise to some degree, it's wonderful to meet you because you contribute you know you make it all possible for us so i mean it's like don't undervalue your contribution i just want to say thank you so it's an honor to meet you real pleasure that's yeah. really nice of you thank you yeah. yeah thank you i hope to see you drive one day i hope to see the show so um, uh, it's not yeah. not going anymore but it was i had a great time at the time yeah thank well you. they might bring yeah. it back yeah sure sure all right yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you that's a whole nother podcast man yeah 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 this is it <laughs> Wow! I can see right. you special guests yeah. straight from the yeah. get-go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have anyone I can pull out of the corner of the screen, so I'm sorry. It's just me. Wow, that's oh, awesome. Yeah. So, Abby, do you have access to that car? Is that the is that car in the UK? Or is uh, it yes, so too? she has it. It's about f uh, half an hour, 40 minutes away. Um, so, actually, someone's just about to take it to make it road legal. So, her eyes have gone all... <laughs> she's excited about it um but yeah it was kept at a place called bedford autodrome in one of their storage units there so um yeah once a month or something she'd go out and give it a thrash around it's wicked dude, dude, right up on this. A, a passenger yeah it's cool dude when i come to london we should go visit the car yeah yeah, yeah sure yeah. she'd be definitely we got a feature yeah, on the site and yeah. key it this is dk's car <laughs> <laughs> He said he's going to keep the car. Yeah. <laughs> Donkey Kong. <laughs> that's, for that, that's for that sucker punch. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, so, I mean, it's a well, real... Yeah. No, you carry on. Alex. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, I mean, we obviously we've, we're you're here to talk about the new car faction stuff and the new episodes you've got with car faction, the, the track mode stuff. But I mean, for people who don't know you, Introduce yourself. What do you do? Go first, Abby. Um, so my name is Abby Eaton. Uh, I've been a racing driver for 18 years. And uh, last year, my good friend, George Collada, asked me if I wanted to be part <laughs> of a new um, online uh, film uh, episode, uh, different episodes uh, featuring circuits around the UK and uh, around the world is what we're going to aim to do. Um, we talk a bit about the history. We have some awesome cars to drive and we generally just have fun and um, yeah, call it a job. <laughs> uh, I'm George Collado. I uh, have been racing for about 15 years, which is roughly the same time I've been in the UK, nearly 16 years now. I'm from Portugal originally, from Lisbon. Uh, and I moved to the UK to sort of chase the... The racing dream 
<laughs> and here I am. Um, essentially, uh, I met Abby, what we, we met at Palmer Sport and we were sort of at the same level, I think, like career wise in terms of you were racing in MX-5s and I was racing the MR2s and we sort of came up through relatively the same channels. He was kind of like instructing at, at race schools and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, we, we were just friends since then. Obviously, Abby got a few cool gigs. I got some other few cool gigs. And eventually, um, co when COVID hit last year, uh, I was I was already working for Carfection and we were kind of reviewed, do, look, lots of car reviews and things like that. And obviously, the manufacturers kind of cut all the global media launches and things like that because of COVID. So I went to Drew, our editor, and I said, look, maybe now it's a good time to, because I had pitched this show like two years, over two years ago. Um, and we, we, you know, it, 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 you liked it and it was sort of shelved for like maybe the, the right time. And I said, well, <laughs> I wouldn't call it the right time, but maybe now is the time. And uh, I, I said, should we do it? And he said, yep, go for it. There's nothing else like going on. So let's let's do this. Uh, we, we had talked about having a co-host, having someone else. And I knew that Abby was doing the Grand Tour stuff. And obviously that had sort of just kind of was on pause as well. Uh, so I said to her, look, what are you doing next Monday? And uh, she said nothing. So yeah, we started doing. Uh, we did the first episode of Donington Park. Um, we'll get onto what like track mode is more in depth. But uh, that's how that's the origin story of of the show, really. So yeah, yeah. I mean, the show really clicked with me because something we want to do at Suggs Garage is just open up the the car industry and the racing and, and all kind of aspects of the motoring industry to people who maybe haven't got the confidence or don't know how to do it. So track mode giving people that um like the kind of lesson because going to a track is really intimidating for the first time like you know going to a track day you have no idea what you're doing you don't know where to park or where to get fuel or how to change your tires or whatever so having that is really great so how did um if someone wanted to do a track day let's say they're not a professional but what would you give what, what would the steps be that you you give them uh i'd, I'd say so if you want to do a track day either bear in mind that if you're going to do it in your own car you're going to have to deal with the consequences whether <laughs> whatever the consequences may be uh it could be nothing it could be as little as you know changing some discs and some pads uh but also you know just jumping in your car and driving it to the track and then going around on track and all of a sudden everyone's flying past you and you're like oh my god uh, it's it's probably best to do like a driving experience day a good one so i don't mean you know the sort of drive a supercar around the car park up to like 50 miles an hour type thing. Um, I, I mean, like, you know, save some money, go and do a good driving experience around the track with an instructor uh, and then be like, okay, I, I think I'd like to do more of this if you decide so. Then, yeah, maybe buy a car specifically for a track day or, you know, make whatever relevant mods to your car um, to be able to take it to a track day and still drive it home afterwards. Um, that that would be the the sort of most logical way to do it. And the first thing, actually, when I say do mods to your car, I just mean the brakes and the pads so it's safe. But don't do mods to your car like turbos, this and that. <laughs> Get an instructor, like pay for instruction, yeah, professional. That's the best money you can spend. That is the best money. You'll That's where Buy you'll the find <laughs> the most time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I'd say absolutely give it a go. But try not to sort of, you know, run before you can walk type thing. So, mm. so you know, when you, I'm sure you've met so many students on your journey as you know, instructors, what what are the characteristics that make a good student? Good listener. And, and then eventually a good driver. Oh, just good listening. Listener. Oh, just, yeah. just someone who listens. Absolutely. Uh, it's for, really difficult yeah. sometimes to do that though, isn't it? You know, like in, in anything, and especially if you're in a kind of high pressure environment, like on a, a circuit, you know, someone can be telling you what to do and giving you a few instructions, but you, you might be listening and you, and and it's going in, but it's actually being able to take on board what's being said. Um, and what I try and kind of say to people is, you know, you, you've driven on the road for, you know, 30 plus years or whatever. Driving on a track is, is completely different. So kind of put your road driving brain on the shelf for a bit and almost be a bit of a puppet. So whatever the instructor says, just do, even if you don't understand why, do it. And then eventually, once you kind of, it becomes a habit, you'll start understanding why you're doing those things. Um, it's not easy, don't get me wrong, you know, it, it's very tricky, but, you know, that's part of the charm of learning how to drive a car on a racetrack. But let's rewind a little bit. So for the guy who's never even been in a go-kart, 
right? And maybe doesn't even know how to drive a manual car and doesn't understand the difference from front wheel and rear, rear wheel. Like, and, you know, these guys, because, you know, I, me and my colleagues have a lot to blame. They watch these movies and all of a sudden they want to start going fast and furious, right? So, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and they do. And so, you know, I, I want to be able to kind of, you know, share a realistic way to become a safe driver. Like for, you know, when I was a kid, if I heard you say, yeah, save up money, I'm like, hey, man, I, I don't make any money. There's nothing to save. <laughs> I got no money to save. But I have this car, I got this little Toyota, and I want to go fast. And so if let's just rewind, like, you know, because I know a lot of guys, when I ask an instructor, they go, let's start with carding. Let's go to, a, you know, electric card and go to a gas card and go to a shifter card. But that's an expensive process. And that mm -hmm. takes time and it takes resources. But for just the reg regular Joe, and there's a lot of regular Joes, like, you know, I, what what guidance can you give to be a good driver and yeah simply that uh do you want to go first abby so there's kind of some golden rules involved in um how to control a car or, or the things that you try and avoid doing so for example um you imagine you you have the steering wheel and you have the accelerator pedal now imagine there's a piece of string that's attached on the bottom of the wheel that goes all the way down to your accelerator pedal now if you turn the wheel it's going to pull that pedal. So you can't put as much acceleration down. You can't put as much gas down. Now, if you get the wheel nice and straight, and as you're straightening it up, that string's becoming more and more slack. It gives you the ability to put more acceleration down. And if you think of it like that, the reason why most people end up, um, you know, you see these videos of people in, you know, high performance supercars, and they get to what they think is a nice straight piece of road, and they give it full power and they end up firing themselves off you know off the off the track and all it is is that there's still some input into the steering wheel so imagine if you want to start increasing your speed and and you know see, see um what the acceleration of this car has got main rule is try and keep the car nice and straight so keep the wheels in a straight line and you know if you've got a thousand horsepower car even if you've got the wheel as straight as you've got and you give it some it still might you know fire you off in one direction or another but um always keep the car nice and straight same for braking if you can keep the car nice and straight while you're braking it's going to be nice and stable um in a straight line if you just lift off the accelerator or you brake all that's going to happen is the car's just going to slow down and it's going to be in a straight line you start adding lateral forces in and, and you've got the front wheels pointing in a bit of a direction or even loads or even just a little bit the moment you add acceleration or braking into it it's going to try and dart you off to whatever way you've got that steering wheel pointed and that goes that's, the same on the road, same on the track. Yeah. Gravel. That's so that's it. That's the answer I needed. It's so fundamental. Yeah, but you can apply the whole braking into the track because that's what all the instructors tell you. They never break on a turn, right? No, so no. Yeah. it's all about yeah. minimizing inputs and giving the car the least amount of things to do at the same time. You know yeah. what I mean? So like it, the whole you know, like trail braking is a technique where you can like brake and sort of still steer at the same time, but that's like advanced you know what i mean what abby's saying about like breaking a straight line turn make sure that you're ready to get the steering wheel straight at least if it's not straight already at least be ready to apply a bit of opposite lock but yeah th those things are all things that you you do discover a bit by doing and and you're right probably the advice i'd give to someone uh who maybe would have started driving when i started driving is yeah go-karting is a good way to do it but it can be expensive. Let's not kid ourselves, you know, like motorsports and cars and all this can get very expensive very quickly. So yeah, yeah just some rental carts is kind of enough to feel a bit of, you know, a bit of feel the, the, the chassis moving in the U, you know what I mean? Just all those, all those components moving at the same time while you're in control gives you a good idea of like, okay, this, these are the things that I need to do. If the back end is skidding, I need to apply, apply a bit of opposite lock. The best way to do it is to just try and find, I know not everyone has private land, obviously, but if you can find somewhere where there's nothing to hit, you know what I mean? Or just like an empty space, an open car park that is legal, you know what I mean? I'm not saying go to a supermarket, but just <laughs> somewhere, um, you know, like sometimes track days can get expensive, but there are companies that organize track days in airfields. You know, and, and that is a little bit cheaper. You Okay, maybe you have some more cars, but you've got less things to hit, so to speak. And uh, Abby mentioned Bedford Autodrome, which, you know, is kind of where we met and where 
uh, we've worked a lot of our professional lives and it is the best place in the UK, dare I say, the world for things like that because it's yeah. basically a converted aerodrome which was built purposely for that, for just you go on the track, go crazy with an instructor, obviously with us, you go absolutely, you know, let it all, let it all hang out, go for it. And if you go off, at least there's nothing to hit. You know what I mean? So that is the ideal place is just to have somewhere where, like, like you said, you know, if you don't even have savings to buy a better car or to buy the car that you want, all you have is this car. If you crash that car, then you got nothing. You know what I mean? Then yeah. you're definitely, yeah. so do it in a place where you can make mistakes and not pay the price, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um, There's quite yeah. a lot of companies that do um, like taster sessions I've seen. So mm -hmm. like novice taster sessions that you can go on and um, pay by the hour or like you have a morning session as well. So I think there's a lot more kind of effort to make thing make motorsport a little bit more accessible. Um, yeah. And even before that, even going back to like, let, let's say, you know, you have this car, you've saved up some money and you really want to go to a track and, and have a go. Um, simulators now, esports, online stuff is yeah. is growing yeah, so much. And point. I think, um, you know, I use that a lot to learn tracks that I'm going to be racing at. You know, for this year coming up, I've got um, six out of eight races are at tracks I've never been to before. So, um I will be on the simulator a lot beforehand and you know you go wrong you make a mistake on the simulator you press restart and away you go so it's a lot safer way to kind of learn at least where you're going and what to expect when you get there but um yeah there's there's no kind of um you know there's nothing better than actually getting your bum in the seat and doing it in person in yeah. real life and you know we understand that it's it's an extremely expensive thing to be involved with um you know we've been very lucky to have the opportunities that we've had as well but um yeah the, the roads that are out there as long as you kind of obviously keep it under the speed limit um you can still learn slightly advanced driving um out there on the open roads yeah there's nothing stopping yeah. you from trying heel and toe in a you know again on on an open road in a safe piece of open road you know i don't want to condone anyone yeah. starting to do apply racing techniques but you know the good racing <laughs> techniques could save your life yeah. on the road you know what i mean you right. good to right. know that you know if you slam the brakes on a car with no abs it's gonna lock like the wheels are going to lock up you know what i mean things like that That's are right. not just reserved for racing it's good to know in the real world uh but abby made a really good point there and i saw not so long ago an article i don't know who wrote it i can't remember now but that Sim racing is the new grassroots motorsport, you know, like it's mm. the, the racing drivers of the future will have been formed, will have come from a beginning in sim racing. And again, mm. there's nothing like driving the real thing and getting it, getting that feel, the noise and, you know, feel, feeling, feeling the seat and the steering wheel. But uh, sim racing is very, very good nowadays a yeah. and a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, did you guys always have this, Need for speed, if you. I'm sorry, it's a coin. <laughs> That's a different That's franchise. True. That's a different <laughs> franchise. <laughs> I mean, did you guys, as as kids, have this need to go fast? I mean, did you always have it in you? Uh, my my story is a bit quicker, so I'll go first, Abby. Like I, yeah. no, I'm I'm a child of. Fast and Furious and Gran Turismo, you know what I mean? The double, <laughs> the deadly double combo. Uh, I literally just, I was 12-ish, I think, and some friends were like, oh, you know, you got to try this game, you got to try this out. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is cool. This is like a better racing game that I've had in the past. It's a bit more complete, loads of cars. All of a sudden you're driving these cars that you could only like dream of. Um, and then obviously Fast and Furious comes out and I'm like, oh, but this is real. Like these cars actually exist. Like that's a, that's a Supra. Wow. Like that's crazy. And uh, it just like snowballed from there. Like I then realized that actual racing was, I mean, obviously I'd seen Formula One and stuff, but that's, that's cars that at the time I couldn't, you know, identify with, so to speak. They're not road cars. Sure. And sure. as soon as I saw that actually like you, you can race these cars, like the people go and race these cars that look like the dad, the, my, the car that my dad drives, you know? Um, like uh, speaking of like DTM and the Vauxhall Vectra, you know what I mean? Or o Opel Vectra, like for example. And I just thought this is insane. Like this is um, like in a good way. I was like, this is amazing. Like I, I don't know. Like, and then I, I went out with some, again, some older friends who could drive and it was like, just, uh, we went out in a Civic, I oh, like check out the VTEC and it's like, Wah! and I just don't know. I was like young and impressionable. And I just thought, 
do you know what? And, it, and it, you're so right there. It was the speed for me. It wasn't so much like I love cars and I love the car culture and I love car people. But for me, it was, it was the speed. It was the like being in control of something going that fast really like it just did something to my brain. I don't know. To the point that I then, yeah, like I left, not left, I finished school, but I didn't go to university. I was like, right, I'm off to the UK. Um, I actually studied, I actually studied Japanese for two years because I was like, right, I'm going to Japan. Like this is, I thought, where are the, where are the places in the world where I can, you know, be surrounded by like motorsport and Japan and the UK were like the, the two countries that were, you know, Portugal, they, like they love racing, they love rallying, but it's just not very, you know what I mean? There's no, there's not much going on in terms of yeah. actual motorsport. There's a legacy. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's a legacy. Uh, there's history, you know what I mean? But there yeah. isn't a track day every other day like there is here in the UK, you know what I mean? So right. I thought, okay, Japan, here I go. And then last minute, I kind of chickened out a bit because... I don't know. I was, I was 18 and like my family was still, you know, they were all very supportive, but the UK to Portugal is a bit closer, you know what I mean? So, uh, and yeah. you know, I already spoke English and you know, my Japanese wasn't necessarily coming on leaps and bounds. So I just moved to the UK and then that was that I, when I got here, sort of got some money together, started racing the MR2 challenge, you then start meeting people who work in racetracks and then it just snowballs from there. And you, yeah, here we are. So wow. yeah, no, no one in my family, no one in my family had anything to do with motorsport. Still, like <laughs> my dad, like, again, nothing to do with motorsport. So I have no idea where there was no influences there. So Interesting. <laughs> you explain. It was that, probably right? it was a good it was a good decision. You didn't come to Japan because you probably would have started looking for Han's garage, and it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Shot that in LA. Well, you're telling me Shut that in LA. Those, cars in those car parks don't actually exist. <laughs> so the drift king is not actually the king. No, he's, he's, no, he's not. He's actually a doctor on a show called <laughs> Chicago MD. <laughs> so he's Doctor King. Yeah, now he's MD, not DK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you, Abby? Where did this this need come from? So mine's a bit different uh, from George there. So my dad's always raced um, ever since he was a young kid. Um, he started on bikes when he was like 16 years old. Um, and in fact, I'm just trying to think, I think he actually didn't have any, or oh, his older brother used to race bikes as well. So I think it maybe came from his brother and kind of passed down like that. But um, yeah, so my, my dad had raced bikes. He did um, some speedway stuff for the bikes and he did uh, some karting and um, 250 national and super karts, like ridiculous. The speed involved in those things is like, it's frightening. Um, some of them are still in the championships that, that run around the UK now. And there's sometimes at the, the same race weekends that um, like car championships are at and they will easily be like 20, 30 seconds uh, a lap quicker than a, than a car wow. going around and you've got no protection in these things it's, it's crazy um so yeah dad did that and then he moved up into cars um when his in fact there was a reason why he ended up moving into cars he had a really big crash in one of his carts and um ended up flipping and it was like two months after i was born and he was like i need to do something that's a little bit safer you know i've got a kid to look after now so then moved into cars and then um, that was where it all began for me. So I was uh, supporting my dad from, you know, being a tiny little baby, you know, growing up around the race circuits. Um, my dad ended up uh, running in a series called mm -hmm. Eurocar and um, had a bit of a kind of corporate hospitality on the side for the sponsor that he had. Um, so mum was involved with running that and, you know, it was a job for them. It, it was a business and, um, you know, I'd be there from, well, they'd, they'd probably turn up maybe uh, Wednesday night. So I'd be there Wednesday night all the way through till, you know, Sunday night, Monday morning. And wow. um, all the kids of all the drivers, you know, back in, in the day when it was kind of safe to do that, that, you know, all the mums and all the, the team owners would always have a little eye out and see where the kids were. And we'd all just go and, and play and, and just muck about on bikes. So I remember I, I loved my mountain bike and my BMX bike. I'd do big stunts and fall off and come crying up to mum with my grazed arm and stuff. And um, I just remember watching watching my dad around the circuit. <clears throat> and it was just, yeah, it's just something that I was like, that just looks so cool. And, you know, seeing my dad come in and seeing how happy he was when he 
he'd done well and you know just seeing the, the passion he had for the sport I was like wow this you know I've got to do this and you know the a question that I get asked quite a lot is obviously you know being a female in a male dominated sport you know some girls now are like what like females girls can race and that never ever entered my mind even back then when it was it was less common to have females in motorsport like it never entered my mind that females couldn't do it and um my dad was racing a, a circuit in the uk in, Sc- in scotland called knock hill and it's got a little go-kart that's that's attached to it and i basically i really really wanted to go on these go-karts like i was obsessed for this weekend that we were there i was like i need to to do this i just like stood like we're looking at this go-kart track with people driving around i was like i need to do this and i asked my mom and dad and they were really busy and they were like no you know it's expensive and blah 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 like we've got stuff to do so i went in the back of the truck and i found um a cardboard box so i cut a little money slot at the top of it and then i went around all the teams and i was i think i must have been like seven at the time i went around all the teams all the awnings and i've got this little box and i'm like my mum wouldn't pay my mum and dad would pay for me to go karting please will you donate for me to go karting <laughs> So obviously everyone was like, of course we will. Like they found it funny, you know, and putting money in and stuff like that. And I got back to the awning and I was like, mum, mum, I've, I've got enough money to go karting. And obviously my mum and dad are absolutely mortified. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe you've done that. Go and give all the money back. But obviously <laughs> no one wanted to take the money back. Um, and, you know, in the end, my dad was like, oh we're gonna to have to go karting aren't we you know um so that's kind of where it started um yeah I started in carts carted for four years and um moved up kind of through the different um, forms of versus sports so I started off in a little Citroen Saxo VTR little 1.6 um was my first kind of junior championship that I was in um moved through to GTs um raced in British GT raced in Blanc Pan in, in Ferrari 488 um GT3 car and then yeah, just going on from that. So it's all all my dad's fault, basically. I could be like <laughs> a rich, successful doctor right now, but I'm a racing <laughs> driver instead, and I love it. But, but there are a lot of kids that are around their parents, and they never adopt what their parents are into. So you had yeah, it in true. you, right? Mm. And mm. so this is something that you know, on a personal level, this week I've had to kind of you know revisit and deal with. You know, it's like. I'm sure in any competitive, you know, field and a competitive sport, you guys deal with disappointment and losses and, you know, and, and my job, actor's job is 99% rejection. You know, we go in and we're told you're, you're too tall, too short, too Asian, not Asian enough. Like, well, I to, hair's too long, too short, whatever. It's, it's, it's usually no, no, no. And there's this Asian phrase says, you know, fall seven times, get up eight. And no matter how old I am, I still get affected every time, Mm -hmm. you know, I get turned down or I guess passed up for a job because we put our heart into it. Because without the passion, I know that you guys wouldn't be here, right? And and I I bet, I don't think there there needs to be another actor in the world. So I love what I do. Like it's borderline obsession. So when friends tell me hey man you know don't get so affected it's so hard but you guys you know I'm sure you're not winning every single race you know it's like those victories are rare so what has what what tools have you learned to deal with that and not get reactive and disappointed and discouraged I don't think I don't think there's ever really any any I don't think I have learned to deal with that yeah (laughs) I think it's just yeah you know, um, yeah, I think everyone deals with it in their own way as well. Yeah. Um, you know, we all we all will get knocked back. It's the same in anything, any any sport, any job. You know, you go for a promotion, you don't get it. You know, it, it's it's life, unfortunately. But <clears throat> I think probably similar with with the the acting is, you know, you have to pitch yourself. And um, for for drivers, the main thing that you get rejection on is is when you're trying to find budget to go racing, and um, I, I'm not from a wealthy background, haven't got a wealthy family and all the, the sponsors and stuff that I secure is all done from me. You know, I can't pay for a manager to go and find them and stuff like that. So I would spend hours and hours and hours doing proposals for companies and I'd want to make it special for them. So I'd spend ages on 
paint shop, like, you know, mucking up these rear suits and cars so that it's striking to them when they look at it. And most of the time you don't even get a response. And all I would want is a response just saying no. You know, I don't mind if they, they don't want to. That's fine because, you know, it's not going to work if they're not 100% in it. But that's that's the thing that's the most um, horrible to do is is, is the, um, you know, not getting a response. So even the no's is, is difficult, you know, to be rejected, as you said. But um, for every no, you're closer to getting a yes. And <laughs> yeah. you just got to stick Take with it, in. which is, is a different way of, of saying, you know, get knocked down seven, get up eight, you know. That's right. That's right. said, like we we spent i mean personally and i know a lot of us like i spend more time behind the laptop than behind the wheel you know what i mean trying to make things happen for things to then happen and 99 percent of the time things don't happen and you just people are like oh you know like never give up and it's like that's that's kind of that's that's a bit of an idea that i've given up so many times and and then gone back you know what i mean so i think if the passion is there like you will eventually think no way this is never happening i'm gonna give up and then you just don't you know what i mean you just you just keep going i i don't know it's like usually at that quite, point yeah. i don't know about you george but yeah. usually at the point you say i've had enough something comes up it, literally like i mm -hmm. i remember like this was about 2009 or so i had potentially you know put together this deal for a, it was a championship in in dubai uh it was at the time that like in the middle east motorsport was like exploding and this uh the i made friends with the championship coordinator and he basically said to me look if you can i need to insure all these cars because they owned all the cars and it was a pay to drive thing i need to insure all these cars if you can get me a good insure there's no motorsport insurance companies out here if you can get me a good deal with the uk insurance company you get a free drive right and there were there were chevrolet cars i spoke to eric nev like literally the head of motorsport for for chevrolet the car was there with my colors on it you know what i mean i wanted to paint it like the same blue as the world touring car car uh, to like just represent what i wanted to get to like the whole thing and this is like this is at this point that you think i've made it you know what i mean like i've all these no's like abby said finally it's a yes and then because it's a very wealthy country for some reason like all all the other drivers who were signed up for the championship came up and said we don't want to pay extra money for insurance like if we break the cars we'll just get new ones we'll just pay for it so the whole deal fell through and i remember like that was the biggest blow to me because i thought i like the car was there with my name on it waiting you know what i mean and you i somehow the no still managed to find its way into my <laughs> into my computer screen and i rem i think i just stayed in bed for a week you know what i mean like sometimes you just like close yourself you off throw a strop don't you literally you just go oh! <laughs> and i'm like right this is it i'm giving up uh, and then you just don't like yeah. you just you just don't give up it's it's weird and i think it's because of the passion if the passion is there you're just going to keep going yeah so. i i'm like you uh, is it george or jorge well like in portuguese it's george i call him jorge she calls yeah. me jorge for <laughs> not from spain you know what i mean so i just go with george it's just easier for everyone you know okay I mean? george yeah. all right george that's cool it's, it's weird it's cause yeah I know. I know a lot of jorge yeah but anyway yeah. george i'm i'm the same with you is when i when i get when I have like a massive like stress related rejection or I start going through that kind of insecurity, my body shuts down and I just yeah. go to sleep. And it's, it's amazing just that sleep. And I wake up a few hours later, just perspective. And then you got to start, it's like Lego, you build that yeah, back, you know, it's you, like, you, you build I the self esteem. Yeah. Yeah. I find yeah. that I can't help it. You know what I mean? I find that I'm yeah. like, right, I give up. I am done trying to like find opportunities. And then I do that, like I either, you know, you either go to sleep or you give it some time. And then after I say to myself, I've given up, I've given up, but my brain's still going like, no, but what if we put this person together with that person and the other person? Yeah, your heart's I given up, but your, you know? your mind yeah, has Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I just find myself straight back at it. And I guess that's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> and what I, what I love about you guys, your energy, 